All right, good morning. Hello and welcome to the Comagine Health weekly webinar series for long-term and post-acute care facilities to support the COVID-19 vaccine and booster rates. I wanna thank you for spending time with us today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Please take a moment to locate the chat feature in this webinar platform. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to share your thoughts, comments, and questions with all participants. Members of our team will be monitoring the chat and will bring your questions forward to our guest advisors during the moderated question and answer portion at the end of today's session. Links to the resources that the presenter shares will also be posted in chat throughout the webinar. Now that you've located the chat, we would like to get to know you, our audience. If you're joining us from a care facility, would you please put your name, your facility's name, and your role in the chat? This webinar is being recorded. The slide deck and recording will be available on the Comagine Health website following this event. And now I would like to introduce you to your presenter today, Lily Mazmanian. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lily Mazmanian and I'm an improvement advisor at Comagine Health. This session is part one of a two-part session on using motivational interviewing in vaccine hesitancy discussions. This session will introduce motivational interviewing concepts we need to understand as a foundation before we have our weekly hesitancy discussions. Next slide, please. Motivational interviewing is a patient-centered, evidence-based practical communication approach developed by clinical psychologists William R. Miller and Stephen Rolnick. It is a facilitation style with the goal of eliciting behavior change by helping patients explore and eventually resolve their ambivalence as a central goal. Next slide, please. As someone that wants to use motivational interviewing, it's important for you to first assess and be self-aware of your own natural communication style before attempting the motivational, before attempting motivational interviewing. This slide shows the different places we can fall in our communication styles. So the director style is someone that takes the lead, telling people what they need to do because they feel like they have the information the patient needs to know to manage the situation and change. The follower style is someone who's a listener and does a lot more listening than they do the talking. They don't jump in to have a conversation and there isn't any structure or input they add to the conversation. They listen and follow where a patient wants to go. And then there's the guide. The guide is someone that helps the patient through thoughtful, evocative, open questions and reflective listening to help them find that motivation for change. The guide falls between the director and follower, and that's where we want to be in motivational interviewing. If you find yourself to have the director communication style, then you can remind yourself that you are there to be a guide because we want to find that place of motivation in our patients to get that behavior change to occur. In healthcare, we naturally fall in the director communication style because the helper inside of us wants to explain things but the outcome of that style doesn't necessarily get the patient where we need them to be, which can cause a roadblock and cause more harm than good. Next slide, please. Roadblocks are distractions that get in the way of allowing the patient to explore their own motivations and ambivalence. Miller and Rolnick talk about these roadblocks as being self-centered versus client-centered. There are many types of roadblocks and there are obvious roadblocks to a conversation, but we can also fall into the lecturing side, giving advice that's unsolicited and providing solutions and a plan without including the patient. Lecturing is a roadblock because when you do this, you're not listening to the patient. And in the heart of motivational interviewing is really listening well to understand the person, their concerns and perspective. There's also, uh, also another roadblock that may not seem like a roadblock and that's praising, which patients may not respond well to because it's like being in a parent-child relationship. It's saying, I'm happy with you because you did what I, I think is good. By using some of these roadblock approaches in our conversations, we may think we're doing things for their own good or even for the greater good. But we have to remember that the patient 
is an individual and we're not there to make choices for them. Sometimes giving advice and providing solutions may hinder the conversation and give the opposite effect of what we're looking for. Generally, we want to say something like, tell me about some concerns you have about the vaccine. A statement like this opens up the line of communication because we're eliciting a conversation and letting them know we're interested in listening to them and understanding them and their concerns. Next slide, please. As healthcare professionals and helpers in our hearts, we often feel a strong urge to tell patients what to do because we're, we've worked hard to gain our knowledge and therefore have strong feelings about what behaviors patients should change. We have a strong urge to tell them the solution to their problem, but that overwhelming need to help and persuade falls into the writing reflex. Even though we know how risky some behaviors are and the dire consequences that can result, we need to remember it's normal to feel ambivalent. When we've been ambivalent in our lives and someone has told us what to do, it was only natural for us to defend our stance. And we need to remind ourselves that that's what our patients are doing now. When we push too hard, we're setting it up so that the person is less likely to do what we want, even though it comes from a place of caring on our part. And it creates opportunities for people to argue with us instead of having an open conversation and sharing of information. We need to remember that people change when they're ready, which may or may not be when or how we think they should be ready. So it's important to accept and roll with their resistance with the hopes of eventually getting them to a place of comfort, trust, and acceptance to change. So when you have that urge to fix the problem by telling someone what to do, it is more, most likely your writing reflex. So suppress it as much as you can and don't project it onto your patient in the former directions. Telling patients what to do doesn't work most of the time. It's tempting, but it can create the opposite effect of what we're looking for. Next slide, please. When we have the urge for the writing reflex, we need to realize it within ourselves, then pause, and instead use the reflections on what the patient said so we can focus on what we've heard and engage the patient in conversation by listening and responding so that we can learn about what motivates them and because we want to build trust with our patients and make them feel respected. We need to understand that true motivation for change is unique to each person. There's no one size fits all solution. So your communication style matters. And within the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is the foundation of every motivational interviewing conversation that takes place, are principles that emphasize a collaborative relationship in which the autonomy of the patient is respected and the patient's intrinsic resources for change are elicited by the clinician. Next slide, please. It would be easy to think that motivational interviewing is a series of techniques, but the underlying reason for how and why we do these things, which we call the spirit of motivational interviewing, is encompassed by four things. Collaboration with your patient, acceptance of your patient, evocation from your patient, and compassion for your patient. And without uh, the underlying spirit of motivational interviewing, you risk little to no change in your patient's behavior. Next slide, please. This four uh, component fundamental approach can be summarized in the acronym PACE. This is the spirit of or mindset that clinicians should always have, and the acronym can serve as an easy reminder to that approach when conducting motivational interviewing. Next slide, please. Um, so let's discuss a bit about each component and we'll start out with partnership. Partnership or collaboration means working in cooperation with the patient where the clinician is supportive rather than persuasive. There is no power dynamic in a partnership. Both clinician and patient are equal. The clinician works alongside a patient rather than opposed to them. A confronting approach is the opposite of the spirit of motivational interviewing. And in a partnership, we respect autonomy. By working collaboratively, we create a positive atmosphere conducive to change and accept differences. 
We avoid persuasion and instead explore concerns and ideas and view the patient as a partner so they are comfortable to discuss change. According to Miller and Rolnick, the patient should see the clinician as a guide who offers information about the paths the patient may choose, not someone who decides the destination. An example of a partnership statement when speaking with patients can be, how do we work together to come up with options? Next slide, please. In acceptance of our patients, we help foster an attitude that we are on their side and that their past choices in life don't negatively affect our perceptions of them. The patient should be accepted for who he or she is and not met with disapproval over any personal decisions that he or she made. It's acknowledging that each person has their own ability to make choices for themselves and respecting their autonomy and whatever, they, whatever choice they make even though it may be different than the choice we would make for ourselves or for them. An example statement of acceptance would be, at the end of the day, you get to decide. I don't want to put more pressure on you. I'm here to support you. Next slide, please. By having compassion, we demonstrate empathy by trying to understand the patient's point of view and what um, the change means to them and conveying we care without pushing our thoughts and beliefs onto them. Statements like, I can see how this is a really difficult decision for you. And it feels like people don't always understand your struggles demonstrates compassion, particularly if they are delivered in a genuine way because it can make someone stop and reconsider their current stance and be open to what was discussed or shared. Next slide, please. In evocation, we make attempts to have discussions that can be reminiscent for the patient to bring out their motivation for change. Discussing a patient's feelings, thoughts, and memories can help change the patient's attitude um, towards behaviors they otherwise wouldn't think about changing. Asking questions such as, how do you see this pandemic ending? Or tell me about some health issues that are important to you or knowing they've received a vaccine in the past, you can say what motivated you to get that vaccine are all examples of evocative questions. Next slide, please. Being aware of our communication style, avoiding the writing reflex and demonstrating the spirit of motivational interviewing will be, will be the biggest drivers in the patient's willingness to change when done in a genuine way. These foundational concepts give you a quick reference to how um, motivational interviewing works and the mindset clinicians should have when discussing behavior change with their patients. In part two, called utilizing motivational interviewing for vaccine hesitancy discussions, we'll go more in depth in how we use motivational interviewing skills and practice with a patient, with examples that you can practice with um, with patients. So I hope you join us next week. Um, next slide, please. And if anyone has any questions, please um, ask them now. Do we have any in chat? So far, there are none in chat. Okay. So I'll give it a few more seconds in case anyone wants to Ask any questions. Okay, so um, let's move on. Next slide, please. This is the first of the weekly webinar series that will be offered um, every Tuesday until April 12th. If you were forwarded this session and don't have the weekly sessions on your calendar, we will include the link to register for this session um, in the chat. Um, which with each weekly session, we will be offering open office hours the Friday following the session to any questions and to hear and learn from your peers. So we hope you can join us. Um, the link for the open office hours will be shared in the chat as well. Next slide. If you're interested in gaining more knowledge about motivational interviewing, consider um, referencing the following resources. They're very good and highly recommended. 
as you can see, one of the resources are from one of the founders of motivational interviewing. And there are, um, there's also a free course available from BMJ Learning that I believe you can access in your free time. Next resource, please. Um, and here are a few books from the founders of motivational interviewing um, that you can um, buy and read if you want more information. As you can see, there's one on healthcare specifically. Next slide, please. Another resource is your state's immunization information system to access your residents or staff's vaccination records. The research to access your state's um, IIS will be shared in the chat. Next slide, please. And finally, um, here's a list um, for each contact in your state, as well as the context for the vaccine booster campaign and NHSN technical support, should you have any questions. And I will, um, is, are there any other questions? Perhaps? If there was anybody that joined us, uh, maybe just called in on audio, you can press star six to unmute yourself if you had a question. Not hearing any, Lily. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a poll today. Please, uh, your feedback is important to us. Um, if you would let us know how we did on your webinar today. And thank you so much for your time. Once again, thank you so much for taking your time to fill out our poll. We look forward to seeing you next week.